Um, we're going to start things off with two things. Um, one, I uh, just want to say hello to everyone who's joining the chat. Hello to Maddie. Hello to uh, Nihal. Um, uh, but if you are just joining, I want you to do uh, one thing for me. Um, I want you to go to the kitchen uh, or go anywhere where there's like an item of food that you want to eat or just eat a little bit of in this session um, and get it now and bring it back. It might be a piece of fruit. Um, it might be, I don't know, it might be like a little mini packet of crisps. Um, it might be a carrot, whatever it is, just get something from the kitchen, something you can eat, even just a grape, um, and bring it back, even a piece of bread, whatever it is, some crackers, whatever it is, bring it back, not a full meal, just something you can quickly grab and come back here, go now. Um, if you're still here, hopefully you still have some food. Um, I have one other thing, which is, uh, oh man, we got heaps of people on the chat. Got Imogen Tinners, <laughs> uh, we got Roz, we got Merz91. Um, okay, uh, another thing I want you to do is maybe you could answer me this question. How are similes similar to a Gen Z or Gen Z Californian teen? Okay, so Gen Z, that's a generation younger than me. I'm Gen Y. So like maybe if you're at school um, and listening to this uh, at home, that would be you. Um, and a Californian teen, how are they similar? So a simile, saying something is like something else. You know, um, what do you reckon, guys? What do you reckon in the chat? Um, <laughs> uh, Maddie Hay has got overnight oats. Um, Merz91 said, can it be a drink? Yes, it can be a drink. It can be a drink. Um, uh, all right, nice, cool, cool. Um, all right, guys, how are similes similar to a Gen Z California teen? Uh, Merz91 says, oh, they say like a lot? Yeah, yeah. A simile is often saying something is like something else and a California teen like likes to like stuff. So yeah, I reckon that's a pretty good one. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, what do you reckon, guys? How are simile similar to a Gen Z Californian teen? Also, if I'm just getting you now and you're just joining us, I need you to race to the kitchen, get yourself an item of food, and I want you to bring it back. Cracker, bread, maybe a piece of fruit, maybe a vegetable, something you can just take a nibble on a bit later on in our session. So go do that now. Go, leave, leave, come back. Um, you're still here, hopefully you got food. Um, maybe you can help me with this. They say like a lot, there's some other things. There's some other reasons and other ways that they are similar to a Californian teen. We're gonna get started now with our session our session, which is how to tell the truth with lies. And similes are an interesting way of maybe doing that. So we're gonna have a little look right now. <clears throat> oh yeah, for those people who are answering, um, how are they similar? Well, they're kind of similar because just like California teen, as Merz91 says, they say like a lot, um, but also they're like a non-committal kind of like, wishy-washy version of a metaphor. They're a subcategory of a metaphor. Um, a metaphor says something is like something else, but a similar, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. A metaphor says something is something else. My love is like the ocean, but a simile doesn't want to commit like that. Nah, the simile is just going to say, my love is like something else. It's kind of similar in these ways. It's not the exact thing. A simile is like a metaphor light, like a, this can of spam light. Um, but a simile can reveal the truth. And often similes do this by being either like funny or beautiful. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a simile beauty pageant. Um, I've got some beauties lined up for you. Um, some similes from literature. Um, I'm going to read them out uh, and I want you to vote on what you think is the most beautiful. Um, vote at the end. Don't vote while I'm doing them. I've got four. So let's go through these. 
Okay. First simile. Um, elderly American ladies leaning on their canes listed towards me like towers of Pisa. Okay. So this is this little saucy boy in the green dress here, Nabokov. What do you reckon? Is this the most beautiful simile? Um, all right. Uh, Maddie Hay says, The Great Gatsby has the most beautiful similes and metaphors the whole way through just saying. Okay, Maddie Hay, I really like The Great Gatsby. Maybe you could find me one. Send it to me. I'd love to read it. Um, and if you can find it in time for this competition, it could be number five. Um, and maybe if it wins, it will... Um, yeah. So find one um, and then send it on the chat line if you can do it in time. Um... <laughs> Merz and I once say it's a beautiful do dog. The okay, this is number two. The water made a sound like kittens lapping. And this is by Rawlings. This is this girl over here. What do you reckon? Is she going to win? This little chihuahua, is she going to win? Um, I know she's she, she looks like a good girl, but is she the most beautiful? What do you reckon with that simile? Like kittens lapping. Uh, the pumpkin master says, I give that a seven out of ten. Ooh, harsh. The next one. She entered, this is number three. She entered with ungainly struggle like some huge awkward chicken torn squawking out of its coop. What do you reckon about this good boy from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Is it the most beautiful simile? What do you reckon? Um, uh, <laughs> Imogen Tinner said, Vladimir Nabadog. Nabba dog, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, let's see. A um, lot of love here for the dogs. Um, oh, cute! I love it from Kieran Wyatt. Are we going to keep going? Simile number four. Okay. Uh, simile number four. In the eastern sky, there was a yellow patch, like a rug laid for the feet of the coming sun. This is by Stephen Crane. What do you reckon? Is this the most beautiful simile. That was number four. So that was the last one. I'm gonna go through them again really quickly and then I want you to vote. So is it gonna be this one here? Um, the comparison of women to Leaning Towers of Pisa. Is it going to be the water made a sound like kittens lapping? Or is it gonna be three? She entered with ungainly struggle like some huge awkward chicken torn squawking out of its coop or in the eastern sky, there was a yellow patch like a rug laid for the feet of the coming sun. Get your votes in now. Let me know what number, one, two, three, or four. Um, and we're going to see who is the most beautiful. Let's have a look. All right. Uh, I'm getting uh, I'm getting some love. Oh, I'm getting some love for three, but three votes for four and one vote for one. Sadly, no votes for two. Um, I think I'm just going to call it there. This one is the winner. This little good boy here in the Eastern sky, there was a yellow patch, like a rug laid for the feet of the coming sun. Okay. So often similes can be beautiful, but in that beauty, they can reveal something true. Now, obviously the Eastern sky is not, um, like a rug. It's not, the sky is not a rug, like just on a like physics level, but maybe in some way it's revealing something about the sun that maybe it's generous, it's welcoming. Uh, maybe that, uh, maybe there's something there that's revealing something true. And similes can reveal things that are true, but they're, like I said, compared to metaphors, they're like non-committal metaphors. Uh, we're going to do another activity now uh, where hopefully you have your item of food uh, or drink. Drink is okay too, like a drink of water, drink of tea, whatever. Hopefully you have your item of food, maybe something left over from breakfast or something for dinner or wh wherever you are in the world. And I'm going to need you to have that food ready for this next activity. Um, also, if you have a pen and paper, or if you don't, I'm assuming you are watching this on a tablet, a laptop, or a phone, and I want you to write it down on one of those. Okay. So in seven minutes, at the end of this, everyone here is going to have a poem. I'm going to prompt you. 
Um, I've done one of these before. I was really impressed with um, some of the stuff that people came up with. Um, we're gonna have a poem at the end of this. Uh, so let's see, some people have said, I just ate my dinner, sorry Kieran Wyatt. Maybe you have some dessert, maybe you have a cracker, maybe some bread, maybe you have fruit, I don't know. Quickly, run to the kitchen, go, now, you can do it. Um, uh, Pumpkin Master said, oh, we need a tiebreaker, yeah! A lot of late votes for number one. Sorry, I already called it with four, and I actually think four is the most beautiful, and that's my vote, so that's the tiebreaker. Sorry, one. You suck. Um, all right, get your food, and we're gonna write this simile poem. Here we go. So, in a pen and paper, or typing up, writing down, firstly, I want you to write this sentence. <clears throat> um, I held it like, and then I want you to hold your item of food. Now you can hold it in many ways. You could hold it like this. You could hold it triumphantly. You could hold it behind your back. You could hold it like a Shakespearean actor. You could hold it in many, many just ways. I just want you to hold it. And I want you to write that, I held it like, and then I want you to say, to have a simile. I held it like, and look, if you don't have pen and paper, write it in the chat. I'd love to see what you come up with. I held it like, and I want you to maybe, Maybe a trick with similes is think outside the box, maybe do a longer simile. I'd love to hear what you come up with. Okay, so the first one, hold your item of food or drink, and then I held it like. Okay, <laughs> someone has just one dried bean. I'd love to see how you hold that. I like that idea. All right, um, uh, if you've got some interesting similes, write them in the chat. Um, maybe you can write your poem by just writing it in the chat. Um, the next one, <clears throat> I want you to write this sentence, the, and then insert whatever food you have. So if you've got an, uh, an orange, the, the orange smelt like, and I want you to a real good sniff of whatever you have, even if it's water, um, whatever it is, just give it a good sniff. And then I want you to give another simile, the smelt like, and it might be like the, the orange smelt like halftime football games, dirt, grit, determination. I don't know. That, that, um, that wasn't amazing. But come up with something. Put it in the chat line if you haven't already. Um, uh, maybe write it at home. That's the second one. So um, it'll just go below. Next one. <clears throat> I want you to take a bite out of your food. Or if you've got drink, just take a sip. And then I want you to write this. No, but while you do it, I want you to like, what is it? What are the feelings? What is it? What does it kind of taste like? What does it remind you of? Um, are you nostalgic for something when you try it? Um, be specific as possible. Similes work when they're specific. Um, that's where um, uh, some of the best similes come from. So there was something about the first bite like and then I want you to write it down. What was it like? It might be like a grenade exploding all over my gums. I don't know. What, what is it? Put down your simile. Um, come up with it. Um, all right. The next one is I want you to just, or if it's a, a, a or drink or whatever, half drunk or half eaten, and, I just want you to place it on a table or place it near you. And I want you to look at it. What does it look like now? You haven't finished eating it. You've just taken one bite. Hopefully if you're the person with just one bean, you haven't eaten the whole thing, just take a little bite, place it down. And I want you to finish this. I want you to look at it and go half eaten. It lay there like half eaten. It lay there like an injured soldier begging for mercy violent. Or maybe it's half eaten, it lay there like uh, a wink from a stranger. So much promise. Uh, okay. And then the last one, the last one I want is, and this is the last one we will have to do, is I want you to finish this. I want you to go, <laughs> Maddie, hey, I'm awful at this. Maddie, hey, did you get the Great Gatsby? Is that what you're awful at? Or are you awful at this activity? Because um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wish I, I wish I could find some Great Gatsby. I really love the Great Gatsby. Find a simile. 
Um, so if you're doing an orange, the, put your item of food, orange was, and then this is not a simile, just one word. The orange was refreshing. Um, or the, and then the next one, the orange was, and then one word, the orange was, um, whoop, the orange was juicy. And then the last one, the orange was, and then I want you to write one sentence. So the orange was refreshing. The orange was juicy. The orange was a promise that was quickly broken and eagerly anticipated as soon as it was done. I don't know, something like that. It, so the last one isn't a simile at all. It's just a long sentence that sums up your feelings towards the item of food. Um, okay, have a go at that. Um, let me know. <laughs> Merz91 said, I think first written poems are always awful. Merz91, that's a really, really good point. When I write poems for the first time, they're so bad. Um, uh, people often say there's no such thing as good writing. It's just good editing. So um, what you've ha got here is the raw ingredients, no pun intended, for a poem, but maybe you can rework it. Maybe you can edit it, cut a line, add a line, have a little play, or at the end of it, just throw it out completely, go, you know what? I tried, but there's nothing good here. Or maybe there's one good line that you take and put into something else. I don't know. Um, good luck with that, Matty Hey. Also, good luck with The Great Gatsby. I want to hear a simile from it. Um, now, if you have or you want to put together a poem, and like I said, there's no such thing as good writing, just good editing, give it a little tweak, give it a little edit, and then send it to me once again at Phil Wilcox. You don't have to, obviously. I'm not your dad or your teacher, but I want to read them. Um, just DM me, send me the poem, and if you do that, I will 100% give you a shout out. Um, so if you're at home right now and you want to just quick, quickly send that um, or edit it and then send it later or like it now and then so you remember and then send it later. Um, cool. Uh, all right. Another question for you guys. We're talking about how to tell the truth with lies. Here's another question for you. Why are carpenter ants, and this is a carpenter ant on the screen, why are carpenter ants the only animal that cannot lie? What do you reckon? What do you reckon at home? Why are carpenter ants the only animal that cannot lie? Hmm. Maddie Hay said it's really, really long, but I will, I hope this is the simile, Maddie Hay. But also, why are carpenter ants the only animal that cannot lie? Let me know. What do you think? Oh, here it is. I'm going to read it out. It is very long. Uh, all right. I'm just going to pull my phone up here. My favorite quote from Gatsby is he must have looked up at an unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a grotesque thing a rose is and how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. A new world, material, without being real, where poor ghosts breathing dreams like air drifted fortuitous, fortuitously about. Whew. Okay. Uh, Ni Nihal said... That, I mean, that's a great quote. I love that quote. There's so much good imagery in this, in uh, The Great Gatsby. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald is a genius. Um, uh, Most no one said, that's a beautiful quote. It is a beautiful quote. Thank you, Maddie Hay. Uh, Nihal said, uh, how are they similar? Because they can't talk? They can talk, actually. Interestingly, Carpenter Ants can talk. Um, Kieran White said, because they all work together. Yeah, but you can work together and you can still lie. Um, just look at politicians. What do you reckon? Why are carpenter ants the only animals that cannot lie? Look, I'm going to tell you, uh, unless there's no more answers, they are the only animal that cannot lie because unfiltered, they communicate by literally vomiting into the mouths of other ants. No filter. So you want to talk about like truth? Truth is vomiting your insides into someone else. Now, there are other animals that do this, like birds for feeding, and even wolves do it to feed. But um, ants are the only uh, animal that do that to communicate. And they communicate by the, what's going on in their mouths and in their stomachs um, for how the other ants need to take care of all the ant larvae and how they're growing. That's what scientists have work, worked out. So why come to ants the only animals that cannot lie? Because there's literally no filter. Um, 
But we're gonna look about at the ultimate filter now. We're gonna be looking at metaphor. So metaphor is the big daddy. It's fully committed. It's right in there. It's not just a half-hearted kind of beautiful, nice little comparison thing like a simile. It's the real deal. It wants a long-term relationship. <clears throat> so a master at telling the truth and using lies to do this uh, was the author who wrote this quote. What do you reckon? Who wrote this quote? Who wrote this quote? Um, Shakespeare, Kieran said Shakespeare and Shakespeare is right. Shakespeare here is obviously using a metaphor. He's saying all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. By players, he's meaning um, actors. They have their exits and their entrances. So what he's saying here literally is that the world, which is a really hard thing to like lock down and define, the world, and he's trying to get to the bottom of what the world is, and so he says the world is something else, but something concrete um, is the stage. Now, when Shakespeare was doing this play, um, he was writing this for it to be performed. So obviously there was a stage. So when he's comparing it to a stage, the people who are hearing it can literally see a stage in front of them. So all of a sudden, this metaphor is very visual and very impacting. Um, but can anyone tell me why this metaphor might be even more clever and special considering Shakespeare and considering where he might have performed this poem, uh, sorry, this, uh, this play, uh, especially with maybe the, a little clue, all the worlds. Um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's theater that he would have plays performed at was actually the globe. That's what it was called. It was called the globe. So when the audience is hearing this and going, all the world's a stage, they're literally looking at the stage and going, yeah, of course the stage is the world because the stage is called the globe and they can see the stage and all of a sudden this metaphor kind of makes sense. Uh, Maddie Hay says the globe. Yeah, well done, Maddie. Sorry, I, I, um, I raced ahead. Um, yes, exactly. Um, and so Shakespeare is using a metaphor here and now a metaphor can be broken down into a various parts. So we're going to have a look at how metaphors work. Now, these are some complicated words. Um, a metaphor is that has actually two things to it. The first thing is the metaphrand and the metaphrand is the thing you're trying to describe. So here, the metaphrand would be the world. Now the meta Fear is the thing that's used to describe the thing you're trying to describe. So in this one here, it would be a stage, a literal stage. However, actually, there are more parts of a metaphor because what else there is with a metaphor is the metaphrand here. So we have <clears throat> the world and we have over here, we have the stage, but there are many characteristics of the thing um, that uh, the stage that is sort of used as a metaphor for the world. And it has many characteristics. So um, on the chat, hit me up. What are some things that you think of when you think stage? Maybe some descriptors. What are some things you think of when you think stage? So I'm going to start things off when I think of stage. Um, Kieran said lights. Incredible. Uh, when I think, uh, most said curtains. Yep. Uh, uh, Kieran said music. Oh, I like music. Great. This is cool. All right. Well, all of a sudden, we have different characteristics of a stage. I'm actually going to use... Who said curtains? I really like curtains. Mer's 91. Curtains is kind of cool. I'm going to use curtains because curtains... The implication with curtains is that they open and then they close. Um, and kind of, it's quite similar a little bit to life and death. So when... Uh, we're saying the world is a stage. We're not just saying that, you know, the world is a performance or a place where a performance happens. We're also maybe saying that it's a place where this performance, a bit where there is life, but then it finishes 
And then when it finishes, it is completely no more. Literally, the lights go out. Maybe the music, the implication there, the met, the paraphrand. So we have a metaphrand and then a metaphor. And then from the metaphor, we have different paraphers. And then we learn something new about the world through the different paraphrands. So we might learn that, for instance, <clears throat> uh, the world is, has life and death. Maybe it's entertaining and can be lighthearted with music. Um, maybe we learn that actually uh, it can be kind of um, startlingly bright, but also dark with the lights. We learn different things about the thing by breaking it up. Um, now, I want to do our own little analysis of metaphor here, uh, why someone uh, in the chat line, I want you to come up with, <clears throat> we're going to come up with a metaphor for what you are like in the morning. So on the chat line, think about what you're like in the morning. And then I want you to try and think of a metaphor for it. So for me, it will be Phil in the morning is <laughs> a bear with a headache. That's what I would come up with. So my meta friend would be me in the morning. And my meta fear would be me with a, a bear with a headache. So Come up, can someone come up with what is going to be their metaphor? What is going to be the thing that they're, the metaphor for what they're like in the morning? Please hit me up in the chat stream and when I'm going to choose the best one, my favorite one, and we're going to completely analyze it through this model. So uh, what do you like in the morning? A metaphor for that, for you specifically, you specifically. Okay, Kieran Wyatt, let's read this. I am a dragon awoken from its thousand year slumber. You said that's not a metaphor? Yes, it is a metaphor. Uh, I like that a lot. So your, our meta friend, we're gonna go with Kieran's. I really like Kieran's here. So Kieran's is going to be, <clears throat> uh, Kieran, oh, I might use black. Okay, Kieran, Wyatt, in morning is dragon woken thousand years okay now on the chat line what what are some things that you think of when you think of a dragon woken for a thousand years what uh what are some things hit me up and they're going to be our paraphers so um i'm going to start things off a dragon woken after a thousand years is um, there's something intense about that. I'm going to just say intense. <laughs> I wonder if Kieran is an intense person. Okay, so intense. What's um, Someone said <laughs> grumpy. We've got gloomy. <laughs> Sorry, Kieran, you're getting thrown under the bus here. Um, angry is another one. Okay, great. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. So all of these things are our paraphers. So what I'm going to do then is all of a sudden the paraphrand is that Kieran Wyatt is <laughs> grumpy in the morning. I'm sorry, Kieran, if I'm throwing you under the bus. Okay, and we've just analyzed it. So um, through this kind of like analysis of how metaphors work, we can get to something that is true. Kieran, you just said here, that is why I said it's not a metaphor. Are you grumpy in the morning? I'd love to know. If not, that's okay. Actually, good for you that you're not grumpy in the morning. We're going to keep moving things on with this next question. So we're talking about truth and lies and how metaphors might illuminate something true. But here's a question for you. Why is language like the Great Barrier Reef? This is a picture of the Great Barrier Reef. It's so beautiful. Um, let me know if you've been there. I've been there. It's, it's stunning. It's dying. Um, uh, why is language like the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, Kieran White said, because it's dying. 
Oh, that is a good answer. Um, yeah, I think that's part of the answer. I think that's part of it. Um, let me explain why I think you're right there, Kieran. Because it's dying. Um, uh, firstly, uh, MERS 91 says because it's full of color. Now nah, that's lame. MERS 91. Nah, I'm joking. That's okay. This is how maybe uh, Kieran White is correct. Because this is how coral reefs form. Uh, first up, they start here. And they start, they start with kind of like a shallow amount of water. They need a shallow amount of water for coral uh, in its uh, kind of like early stages to swim around and lodge onto somewhere that's shallow enough, that has enough light, enough warmth for it to grow. Then it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows, it expands, and then eventually it dies. And as it dies, and over time, as all the coral kind of dies, it builds up a bed like this that is close enough um, to the top of the water for coral to flourish. But underneath it is a huge layer of like limestone, dead coral until uh, it builds up. And as you can see, this is the present filled in um, coral reef, but only the stuff on the top is alive. Everything else dead. So Kieran White, in a way you're kind of right because language is like this. I'll give you an example. Even the word metaphor. Now metaphor comes from a Latin word. So way back in the day comes from a Latin word, which means <clears throat> to carry on, which is weird. Now carrying is literally a thing that you do. Um, and then it got picked up by old French. Um, and then to be metaphor, but with an E at the end. And it means something similar to carry on, but it's not carrying anymore. It's to move on. And then until we get metaphor now, which describes something as something else. Now, literally when it was in Latin, it the meaning of metaphor was a metaphor to carry on. And now that meaning has been so lost and dead that it is literally metaphor is a dead metaphor. It is a dead metaphor about itself that doesn't have any resonance today. Um, and on top of that, we can build some things that are alive and true and sparkly and colorful, but it itself is dead. Now, we're going to quickly go into this. What are some similarities between these two things here? Um, we've got a 1984 original Macintosh computer mouse, and we've got a real life animal mouse. What are some similarities here between these guys? Um, I think one of them is uh, the color. Mers91 said tails. Yes. Uh, Kieran White said, would you do an episode on language, how they evolve and change in different cultures? It'd be, I'd be so interested in that. That is such a good idea. Yes. Um, the study of kind of languages is linguistics and specifically you're talking about etymology and how words have their origins. I would love to do that. I'm just going to finish this session real quickly. Um, uh, Imogen Tinner said, I agree with, with Kieran. Thanks, Imogen Tinners. Um, tails, color. Uh, another one is like a little bit of the appearance of the mouse as well, I think. Nihal said, same. Guys, I'm going to do this. Next week, it's happening. You call for it? Linguistics and etymology, we're going to do one. Yes, I love that. Um, appearance. And that's why, for instance, the mouse is called the mouse. It was literally a metaphor, um, uh, kind of kind of in the name. It's sort of very similar to a mouse in appearance and it has certain characteristics, so it's called a mouse. However, this is what mouse, mouses? I know it's not mice when it's computer, I don't know, uh, look like now. This is the current Apple mouse. And these are the options that I get when I typed in Google to Google Images computer mouse. And so they're different colors. They don't have a tail anymore because they're all Bluetooth wireless. Um, and they don't even look similar. Like this one here is kind of weirdly raised. It doesn't have the same appearance as a mouse. However, we're still going to call it a mouse. Now, over time, why that was called a mouse will be forgotten as mouse. Uh, computer mouse will change and change and change and change and there's like a trackpad and maybe we do stuff with our eyes but maybe we'll still call something a mouse and that is what's happening here layer upon layer that's what language is dead things upon dead things upon dead things until completely they're forgotten um, and we come up with new metaphors and that's what cliches are when I say something like 
Uh, don't worry, we got lo- we've got loads of time, which we don't. I've got to end this session soon. But we've got loads of time. You don't think about literal loads in a wheelbarrow of time. Instead, it's now a cliche. It's now an expression. It's now some dead coral in here that builds upon our bed of language. Um, and this is what this is what language does, and this is what metaphors do. Metaphors, um, what Frederick Nietzsche thought metaphors were, is on this. He said that in describing metaphors, well, describing what truth was, he used metaphors to describe truth. So he said about truth that truth is really a mobile army of metaphors. He said that in short a sum of human relations which have been enhanced and embellished poetically, so with metaphors, and after which long use seems firm. It seems legit, canonical. It seems like the done thing. But actually, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. Metaphors which are worn out and without any power. In fact... Metaphors are coins which have lost their pitches and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. I mean, he's using a metaphor there. Um, But yeah, after a little while, it loses its meaning, but we still have its raw elements, the metal or the cliche or the expression. And so arguably... Frederick Nietzsche was the kind of original, he's called often the godfather of postmodernism, that actually that maybe all language is just old metaphors stacked on top of each other and then new metaphors at the top. And it's really just a huge dead coral reef of lies, which is a metaphor as well. Um, Having said that, Nietzsche was crazy, struggling with syphilis and kind of dying. So... Who knows if he's really true or really right. Let me know what you think. Um, I would love um, to do a session uh, like you guys recommended on how language develops over time. I think that was a great suggestion. Um, uh, So guys, thank you so much. We're going to end it there. What do you think? Um, Are metaphors about telling the truth through lies or are they about telling lies through true things that exist in the world? Let me know what you think uh, or about that. Um, my name's Phil Wilcox. Uh, this has been really great. Um, let me know uh, if you've got your poems. You can hit me up on Instagram. But otherwise, um, I'm going to sign out right well. Okay.